I like that in some manner or another, given. Uh, <laughs> could you expound on that? <laughs> I think he knew exactly what he was talking about. I'm not a rector, pulpit, minister, or even a near rector when I suppose, but uh, I tried it once or twice, and my daughter said I was too loud, and uh, my dad said, I didn't understand you. <laughs> I kind of give that up, but I, I do love to proclaim the Lord as far as that's concerned. So in, in doing with that, I, I made all these notes to come over here. I actually had 20 pages, but now the first uh, 15 got covered with Dallas and Irving yesterday, so <laughs> this will help our time this evening. But I got to look in the lunch, uh, and uh, after Brother Hopkins got through, my whole thing you know was uh, pretty well covered so uh, I guess I'll just kind of visit with you I think I'd like to comment on some of the things that God said uh, now believe you me it didn't worry me when my daughter said I was too loud and my dad said I don't understand what you're talking about and the reason it didn't I know the Lord uh, it's a uh, Matter of fact, uh, when you know the Lord, there's a whole lot of things that makes no difference then in your life. Like this 130 speaking time, that's ever 400 million Latinos know you take a siesta. And so, <laughs> if you feel like sleeping more than listening, well, go ahead. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, maybe if you get through listening before I get through talking, raise your hand. <laughs> get on the same wavelength here. Um, and we felt a close relationship. Yeah, I know the Lord. Uh, I, I sometimes wish if I walked in, uh, could turn around and say, who's that? Well, believe you me, I hope they say it to me. I'm going to walk right up and say, that's my father. And more than that, I'm going, I got Semitic blood in me. A lot of y'all don't know that. You think I'm just no subject. I would say, Abba, Father. And with no disrespect, that's close. Absolutely, I know the Lord, and I don't mind when other things happen. But this close relationship that you and I have had this week, uh, it has so touched me. I've hugged people. I thought I knew them. Well, I did. Face of Jesus Christ is shining in them. And I was hoping it shined in me, and that's the reason I thought I knew it. One Jew at the last week, no, I've never seen you before in my life. But we, 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 I've been hugging people here I've never seen. They were hugging back. Oh, that, and you see, that's knowing the Lord, how delightful this close relationship can be. But I couldn't have done this 10 years ago. But 10 years ago, if you'd invited me, I wouldn't have come. My goodness, I, I didn't know the Lord nor you. And oh, and if I'd have come, I'd have reminded you Yankees killed my granddad. He's, <laughs> he's, he's, you've got one of them buried up there. No, some of here from the Lord. you got my granddad buried up there. And, and I've got some more. You shot one over here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I'm not appreciative of that. <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> I know the Lord has called us out of hostility and friendship. Oh, how wonderful. Amen. Out of wrath into the fullness of his love. That's what I know what the Lord's about. Out of condemnation into justification. Out of alienation into a brotherhood. Oh, into a gospel of peace. And therefore, peace be unto you. I'm not going to resurrect the dead here. Uh, uh, except Jesus. God resurrected him. Okay, so our relationship is close. Are we not all of the seed of Abraham? Yes, we're the son of Abraham. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something, though. Okay, everything's personal with me. If I can't find a personal uh, identity with what's happening in my life in the scriptures, I just forget it and act like it never happened. But when I, I mean, we live in a real world, and I've got to find real meaning to God's message in the life that I live. And in this relationship that we have as children of Abraham, I also got to tell you, I'm the son of, of uh, Alabama. I've got 16 grandfathers buried here. 
And uh, it, it's meaningful to me. I've been running around all week looking for someone from Alabama. And, you know, this guy's from Kentucky. And that guy's from, they live here. It's like living in Dallas. You can't find any Texan. But that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I've got 70 grandparents buried from Georgia to Texas. And so, in need, I'm a son of the South. But God bless you people from Kentucky. I've got a grandmother born there in 1776. And, well, I guess that makes me uh, kin to you also. Well, I even got one from Pennsylvania. God bless him. He moved to Mississippi. So that helped a little bit. But <laughs> I'm not, am I not a child with you of this universe? And time would forbid me to tell you about all the other grandparents that I got from England. Oh, Germany. Dan, I spent last night with Dan. He and I are from Rowan County. Well, I'm close. So he's close, but I'm a little farther. Uh, but we also, we got 10 folks in Germany. And uh, and I could go on and think, oh, I've got a grandfather in Iraq. That's where the Semitic blood come from. Let me tell you about that, Grand. I must, uh, I lost my notes and so we pulled him up. So I'm going to tell you about this grand, grandfather in Iraq. He had a, a beautiful wife. Let me tell you what, if you read about the sheiks with all the all money, far, far superior to the and what that man had. And he had a father that set him up. And he had land beyond description. He had a dominion beyond description. He had everything that this world could have given him, all supplied him by father, including a beautiful, lovely wife. He made the worst deal that this world could ever have a match and lost it all. He was 160 generations ago. His name was Adam and his wife and his And his father, exactly, that's not long ago, 160 generations. His father had set him up perfectly, but I cannot go through him to get to the father because his father is on him. And left me to force my heritage. He lost it all. And so, I'm looking for someone to adopt me. And so that father that disinherited him said, even unto him, that he was had a begotten son, an only begotten son, in which this could be restored, and Leon could regain his inheritance. And so even with Uncle Abe, he was Uncle Abe, he's not Uncle This is personal. This is not a pigmentation of your man. These are real people and real historical things. Uncle Abel began to show me how to act in this world Send and grief until that promise was fulfilled. As he testifies to me even today of his faith, Uncle Tane didn't handle it so well. So these two brothers were at war, and man has been at war ever since. But God bless many others. So you, you, we mentioned Enoch. Only the, uh, the scripture says, seven from Adam, to testify that God would come and destroy this earth. Thousands of his angels. All put his in this way that God was going to destroy it because there were some that knew not God and obeyed not the gospel. He was going to take vengeance upon him. And there in those simply three men is the world's event totally portrayed to us that God wants us to know him and walk with him as he is did. And Paul says that some would not. And Abel showed us how you could appropriate it that walk through faith. But there were so many other aunts and uncles and descendants of uh, those people, and therefore came to us, that told of this coming one, this coming one, I want to emphasize, of how that he was going to restore all this. And that's the rest of the Bible, as you well know. Well, what are we to make of this? When along comes our uncle, our forefather, Abraham, 
who was testified to be the father of these faithful. But did he not have a grandson who in turn had 12 sons? All came to you and I were. These were not mysterious people. These were my kin folks. And two of those people of those sons I'd like to tell you about just a moment. Levi and Judah. Now from Levi, I had a kinsman named Moses and give a great deliverance of God's people and helped us to understand what it was to know God. But let me tell you what, his happiest moment when he says, hey, I'm going to have a nephew over here that's going to come from Judah. Hear ye him. That's the ancestor that you want to listen to. And so in the ensuing years, their descendants all talked about this coming one. And one of those was a man named Isaiah. And it's been testified also ably by previous speakers of how Isaiah was one of the preeminent foretellers of this coming one. And while prophesying of this coming one, he made the assertion all earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. Now, why in the world would Isaiah make such a statement? And what possibly could it mean? The context is five chapters. And I'm going to tell you about those five chapters in about three minutes. So hang on. It starts with chapter 8 and it goes to chapter 12. This is the context. And Isaiah was told, write it down. So we've got it right here. God bless you. All right, here's what God tells Isaiah to do and write down and what was going to happen. He starts in Isaiah 8 chapter and he says, Isaiah, all the northern kingdoms up there of my people, they're going to, I'm going to wipe them out. God destroys Damascus and Samaria. They're going to be plundered by the Assyrians because they have rejected me and rejected my way. And then he goes on in the 11th through the 17th verse in the 8th chapter. He says, now I say, here's how you need to uh, react to this type of situation. For after all, it's not going to do them any good uh, to build their defenses. And they're not going to prevail. So I've spoken, and it's going to be that way. But what you need to do is not follow those people. And you be concerned about matters that are important to you, that are not important to them. So Isaiah's response, oh, I love this. He says, son, I'll just wait on you, and I'm going to put my trust in you. Now, if that is not a poignant, terse definition of faith, I don't know what one is. Anyway, that, I personally relate to that. I'll wait on you, Lord, and I'm going to put my trust in you. And so Isaiah rejects, he says, the world's ways of wisdom, the mediums of this world, the spiritualists of this world. I don't know what Shirley McLean would say about that. It sounded to me like the New Age movement is so new. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's neither new nor white. But anyway, Isaiah rejected the mediums and the spiritualists. And God goes ahead in the latter part of that eighth chapter because people, Isaiah said, had not sought the law and the testimony. They would have distress. See, darkness and fearful doom and woe, right there in that exclamation of these people seeing doom, he says, but the people will see a great light. Those that have walked in darkness, those living in the land of the shadow of the death, a light is gone, and they will see a great light. Now, when that happens? Well, the New Testament says it happens in Christ. That as he come forth from his trials and temptations, you do a lot when you come forth, a conqueror of trials and temptations, as he went around the Sea of Galilee, the people there saw a great light. So I don't have to wonder what Isaiah is talking about, nor, more specifically, do I want to have to wonder who he was talking about. He was talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, right on down the line, we've already heard all the verses read this week. For a child is going to be born, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, wonderful counselor, God Almighty, all those wonderful passages. But I wanted you to understand 
the broader context of this. Well, we'll go ahead into this ninth chapter. God explains his anger against Israel again and what God is going to do to these people by the Assyrians. Then we get into the tenth chapter. God says, well, not just because they use the Assyrians to take vengeance upon my people, no sign they're guiltless, I am going to take my vengeance upon both. And so in the tenth chapter, um, this is explained to Isaiah. And later on in the tenth chapter, God states that in all of this destruction that he's planning both for Israel, Jacob, and Assyria, and uh, uh, both sides, that there was going to be a remnant that would truly rely upon the Lord. And then finally, he says in the 11th chapter, for a root, a shoot will come up out of the stump of Jesse, from the roots a branch, bear fruit, the Spirit of the Lord rest upon him. And we're talking about the whole context, of course, and some of it's already been writ, writ, uh, uh, read for us, is the prophecy of the coming one. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Therefore, again, we all agree to that. Let us also consider what is going to this uh, shoot, this root uh, that is coming forth, branch, is going to be. He's going to be the spirit of wisdom. Now, it's getting close to knowledge. Maybe even a little farther. All right? I don't know. He's going to be wise, but he's going to be knowing. No, he's going to be knowing unless he knows about. We're talking of Jesus here. The spirit of wisdom and understanding and counsel and power. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we'll go ahead here in this other chapter. A wonderful <coughs> discussion of Jesus' work here upon this earth and what he was going to do. And right in the midst of it, the writer says, and all the earth is filled with the knowledge of God. Now how, pray tell me, are we talking about everybody else and not talking about Jesus? The whole context, the whole close context and far context is focusing upon Jesus. And no matter what else the verse may mean to it must mean nothing until you understand that the writer is talking about Jesus being the wisdom and the knowledge of God upon this earth. And as he is full of the knowledge of God on this earth, the earth is filled with the knowledge of God is what the context primarily means. And whatever else it means, uh, that's fine with me also. But I do want you to know that it means this. Well, you add, this introduces the very idea of one man standing for the whole world. Well, now, is that foolish? Well, according to some, it is. But is it foolish according to God? Well, you all know the story of Adam. It was uh, uh, Brother Stoner explained that yesterday. How that Adam stood for the whole world. And that Jesus was the second Adam, the last Adam, and representative of all the world. Our problem, now, and look, I was raised believing all my life that Jesus Christ died for me, and that's a wonderful thought. But my problem is, is I didn't understand what else Jesus could represent for all of the world. Why? If Jesus, by the way, not only did Jesus Die for me, he lived for me. The writer of the book of uh, Hebrews explains that to us explicitly. Jesus, you know, uh, the, uh, he was commenting on the previous passages there in the uh, Old uh, Testament scriptures, but the writer of Hebrews stops and says that Jesus came to do the will of God in that body that God had given him. And he said, by that will, that's his life. Keeping the will of God. If that's not Jesus' life, what is it? By that life, then, that he kept in that body, I am made whole. Now, how'd that happen? If that's not substitution. So not only did he die for me, now I found out he lived with me. Uh, for me. Now, not only did I find out he died for me, lived for me, found out he is mine now. Well, now some people don't want like substitution. I remember when I was in the fourth grade, they said in the kids to uh, take my place on the football team. I didn't like that. Well, I'm a Christian. 
back, and so-called Christians are exactly that like. Well, I'm much like such a teacher. That's all fine for you. That part of me to go to hell. I'm going to look up and care of my own life here. Don't want that to be a substitution. Well, now, let me tell you, we misunderstood substitution. Let me explain it this way. No greater motivation in the world than to have a good substitute. I'll guarantee you that guy <laughs> had a hard time later on uh, by him sending in that substitute for me in football. Did you ever make me a worse football player? I worked out the hard for me too. I'm going to tell you, brother, if you ever decide that Jesus is your substitute in death, in life, in knowledge, it'll make you a better person. Amen. It will make you, that's the greatest motivation in the world, Amen. to know God. Is to understand that Jesus is our substitute Amen. in wisdom, counsel, knowledge, life, and death Amen. on this earth. Amen. And we just want to take him over here for a little bit of, uh, you know, someone's got to go to hell, might as well be him, and, and just move right on. Let me tell you what, our will begin to know God better when we can fully accept and understand the substitution of strength and enough to choose, I think, to. Uh, uh, a little bit better than, than we are. Well, what did Isaiah think about being a substitute? Well, right after that verse, he says, in that day, what day? The day he's been talking about Jesus coming. The root of Jesse, who we're talking about here, Jesus, will stand as a banner, a flag. What does a flag represent? The whole people. But Joe Beckett, you know what he was saying, don't you? You name enough of it to use it as a match upon a paper. It stands for all the <coughs> Jesus will stand for all the people in that day, a banner for the people. Now, is it true that when we get a substitute that stands for all of the people, what happens? What's the reaction? It is true. As Isaiah says here, then, in that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time and begin to reclaim people, to bring them into his ecclesia, if you please. Re he reaches down into Assyria, oh, up into Assyria, down into lower Egypt, up with Egypt, Cush, Edom, Babylon, Ham, the islands of the sea, and begins to draw them in from this broad range of place. He'll raise a banner again, this Jesus, for the nations. Gather the exiles from around the world, from the four quarters of the earth, he says. Pray tell me, that is a double fulfillment. And all the world should be filled with an olive of God. But you will not fulfill one corner of this world with the knowledge of God until you understand that Jesus was explicitly and implicitly God's knowledge upon this earth. Mm -hmm. Now, how am I to react to all this? I must move along. How am I to react to all this? Praise the Lord. This is where I shine. I like to see these preachers get up and proclaim, and I like to claim, well, what am I going to do about this and put it into human terms? God bless Isaiah. He told us how to react to all this. That's what Cliff chapter's got. Well, most of us, well, we, we, we've got enough verses here to debate on the rest of our life and all the people and his ideas, the evil and his ideas, and all the world we're doing, all, all that. But uh, uh, let's just debate this. Now, I'm going to do what Isaiah did. He says, in that day, you will say, that is the people. I'm one of those Jews. I will praise you, O Lord. Do you were angry with me? That your anger is turned away. You comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. Surely the Lord is my strength. Surely he is my song. He has become my salvation. With joy, he will draw water from the wells of salvation. Amen. Okay, in that day, i got something else to say. Give thanks to the Lord. Why not? He's been my knowledge upon this earth. Call on his 
because I'm justified, how can I be justified? Only because he kept his will in that body for me. Okay, that's my justification. Well, now, I thought I had one scripture in our good brother this morning. He says, but you didn't catch it. He, he moved right on. And uh, so I'm going to use it again. Uh, here in, in, in Corinthians, uh, he's, uh, Paul had said to those people, a friend, by the way, they obviously uh, quite, a, quite a congregation, uh, one similar to, uh, I'm afraid, some of ours today. Uh, they were uh, unrich people. Uh, the Bible said that that group was enriched in the knowledge about Jesus Christ. It had even been confirmed that we didn't have to doubt that uh, by the gifts of the Holy Spirit and all mine. What a devastating mess that that people were in, that were filled with the knowledge of God, even confirmed by the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean to you about being filled with the knowledge about Jesus Christ and having tremendous gifts of the Holy Spirit? That certainly doesn't mean you arrived at all those things that you talking about, you know, wisdom of the world. It's useful. Uh, I'm sure they'd be useless to uh, these friendly people. Yet even their knowledge about God and about Jesus and having the gifts of the Holy Spirit was not the final answer. Thus Paul turned around to them and says, I insist that you let for you Jesus become, listen to his words, your wisdom, your righteousness, your holiness, and your redemption, which is precisely what Isaiah said Jesus would do. And now, Paul's insisting that they let that happen in their life. Okay? Uh, is that not the fulfillment of the Isaiah prophet? Well, how wonderful it is then that Jesus can be my wisdom and righteousness and knowledge and hope. But again, I want to emphasize it in a little bit on. Don't think for one moment that we're circumventing anything. God is just giving you the prime motivator of becoming wise yourself when you understand that Jesus is the wisdom of God here on this earth. And so, uh, he exhorts them to accept that. Now, our heritage, briefly, has been reduced to boasting about knowing about it. That, unfortunately, is what the Restoration Heritage that, that we're all part of has become mostly in the last certainly two generations and maybe earlier. We boasted in what we knew about, not in knowing the world. And what we knew about was reduced to a set of propositions and we would boast about them enough that we would hold our endless debates on them. Well, uh, our boast, of course, of Paul, is that we should know the Lord. Uh, Mark Twain's been invoked. I want to wake you up here a moment. Uh, uh, I don't know why it takes Mark Twain to wake somebody up and invariably mention his name. And Brother Harold, you see, and I, I guess the devil made me do this. I thought about Mark Twain as his relationship with his wife was one very tenuous because Mark Twain was, uh, uh, well, he cursed <laughs> and used God's name in vain. And his wife found that very offensive, God bless her, and she couldn't stop it. But after being a week uh, on uh, making speeches, he'd come home, his wife said, decide, I'm going to put a stop to this. And she met him at the door, she'd been practicing all day, met him at the door, with a string of profanities to his face. And he very stoically sat there and in reaction said, Honey, you got the words, but you don't have the music. <laughs> <laughs> the restoration heritage has had the words, but we've lost the music. We have known about God, but we haven't known God. A couple of what are called tidbits to know the Lord and to understand the Lord. First, to admit your own ignorance. 
You never trust in your own wisdom. That's why faith is simply not reduced to knowing about something which we have claimed, much to our restoration heritage uh, discredit, and we should avoid that. Paul is urging, urging, pressing home his point to these people that no matter how much they know, their answers to questions are often the answers to the wrong questions. The paradox of Scripture is that he would know the Lord at first see his own stupidity. Indeed, what Jesus was, we can become only when we accept what he was. Amen. He died for me, therefore I can die. I couldn't have more died of sin than a man of money if he hadn't died for me. Don't you understand that? Yeah. And can I live for him until I can understand that he lived for me. Amen. And neither can I know God until I understand that he was God's knowledge. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, two prime examples, favorite examples, not prime. Did Job not have a lot of answers? And some wonderful theology. His friends' questions didn't baffle Job. Uh, praise the Lord. And when he stated such things as the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. How we have all said amen to those wonderful theological statements that trouble was. And he was answering questions very often coming from the wrong source. Therefore, they had to be the wrong questions. Or as I'm concerned, he, he has the right question from a wrong source. So let's let the right man ask the question. Now God asked him questions. But he will. About 70 of them. How many answers did Job have? Well, mm -hmm. one man says, don't believe it in you. Don't believe it in you. But let's let Job speak for himself in this matter and see how his reaction to it. It's been quoted this week too. I tore it. It's all in my notes. And I, it's been quoted twice that I've heard. Sure, said Job, I spoke of things that I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. My eyes have heard of you. My ears have heard of you. But now my eyes have seen you. But what was not quoted was the rest of the story. And we'd be a mess if I don't tell you what the rest of the story is. And here is when you know whether you've seen the Lord or not. And therefore, whether you know the Lord or not, therefore I repent. Yeah. And dust and ashes. Therefore I abhor myself. Now I've seen a lot of people as Brother Hoffman said. Oh, how they could answer the questions and how they could quote the scriptures, but you've never seen God unless it brings you to your knees. Amen. And Amen. a lot of repentance and a harvest of your soul. And I don't see, I'm just being frank with you, I don't see any of that the restoration of evidence. My brother accused me as I have seen the grace of God and his work here upon this earth. So are you just trying to do this? trying to do that. You know, you're just trying to get us to act like those over yonder. Oh, they, they, they have no idea what you're talking about. I'm not trying to get us to act like those over yonder. Those over yonder just got a different set of three to five card uh, religion. What we need to do is see God and repent and not be boastful of our knowledge of Him. How do you like this theology? Man, it is good, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, rather than red as crimson, they shall be like wool. The sign will be redeemed from justice with justice. Her penitent one with righteousness, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established, it will be chief among the mountains, it will be raised to the hills, the Lord of the Almighty will be exalted by his justice, the Holy God will show himself holy to uh, righteousness. Well, on all we go. Five power packed chapters by one of the greatest theologians that ever lived. Wouldn't you say amen to all of Isaiah's writings? 
Here's what Isaiah himself said. As then he come into the presence of God, he said, Woe is me, I'm going to Amen. Amen. Let me tell you what, the knowledge of God will bring you to your knees and quit. And if it doesn't, you still just know what about it. I am full up to here with the bragging of the pulpit and people that says, oh, let me show you our church. We are eaten up with it and no wonder we do not know God. It has not brought us to this life of repentance. Now I began this and now I conclude this. I began to do a little lot of harm to myself. I concluded with the uh, inspired autobiography of the Apostle Paul as he in 2 Corinthians relates to his, the Corinthians, his travels and tensions toward them and assures them that he, upon coming, is not going to be wishy-washy, maybe yes, maybe no, maybe something in the middle, but he is going to be positive about matters. He is going to be yes to them on his next visit, then abruptly he says, hold on, i got uh, something to take you even more important than that. That reminds me that no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Okay, so God, you promised Isaiah that you were going to fill this earth with your knowledge. Thus, that scripture might be fulfilled, my contention is, is Jesus fulfilled that promise also. How wonderful. He is God's knowledge on this earth. And I just think it would do all men well to respond like Paul responded upon that occasion when he said, and so through Jesus Christ, the amen is spoken by us. So what he is saying here, I say, God, did you fulfill the earth in your knowledge? Like he told Isaiah, he said, Leon, I sent my son, and I would say, Amen. But I can only boldly say that through Jesus Christ. Amen. Because as I see God and his knowledge upon this earth, my mouth is stopped. My heart is brought low. I am humble 